right. So, <clears throat> we are in the book of Daniel. Oh, you say, well, what do you mean? We, <laughs> it's been three weeks that we took some time off for Easter. But I want us to get caught back up to where we are. We're Daniel chapter 7. And uh, remember, the first six chapters of Daniel were all historical. Daniel is telling his story from the time that he was taken there as a teenager and, uh, and ended up uh, ending the story at age 80. So at age 80, he, he write, he's writing his story. We come to chapter 7, and it shifts. It shifts to him telling prophecy. He's telling dreams that he had even before the, the time that he ended in chapter 6. So chapter 7, he tells us this dream. In the first 14 verses, uh, a dream that took place in the first year of King Belshazzar. So, so we're, we're rolling back the clock six or seven years. And he's telling us a dream that he had. Now, Daniel has had dreams repeatedly all the way from the time that he's a young man. And he's not going to share all of them with us, but he's going to share some of them. And last time we were together in Daniel, in those first 14 verses, he had this dream about the four beasts. And the first beast was a lion. And we know that we compared the lion to the, also the statue in chapter 2, right? He's, he interpreted the dream for the king. So we're going to go back, and this lion represented Babylon, the tri, the, the, where uh, King Nebuchadnezzar through King Belshazzar, the, the kingdom of Babylon. And the next one, is the beast, is going to be a bear. And that bear represents the Medo-Persian Empire. They came in, they swept through, they took Babylon out. They also took out uh, a country ab above them, okay, in what we would call uh, Asia Minor. And they took out Egypt. And so the bear, Medo-Persia, they lasted until the third one comes along. And the third one is a panther with four heads. Now, how would you like to meet that out in the woods? Right? And so we have this panther, and that is representative of the Greeks. So Alexander the Great sweeps down from Greece. He comes through. He's known for how rapidly he moved. And the fact that his, he had an army that was much smaller than many of them that he conquered. But he moved so quickly, he was able, able to overtake them. And then the four heads represent the fact that Alexander the Great died in his early 30s. And his, the, he, he gave his kingdom to his four generals. And they're going to take over. And they will remain in power until the Romans come into play. And the Roman Empire and on into the future is the fourth beast. Now, in, in his dream here, we see that he doesn't have an image for it. Previously, in chapter 2, we would put the Roman Empire, the legs of iron in the statue, the legs of iron. But then it goes into feet that is clay and iron mixed together, and it has Ten toes. And so we're going to see uh, the rest of the chapter is going to be Daniel getting this interpretation. Now, when we, leave, when we left Daniel in verse 14 of chapter 7, he was in the throne room of heaven. And uh, the Ancient of Days, the Father's there, the Son of Man is there. They're sitting on the throne. He's in the throne room of heaven. And uh, when we get to verse 15 and following, he's got some questions. Because in the throne room of heaven, they see the perspective of eternity. We are in time. 
We can look back at time, right? We can study history, and a lot of what Daniel has seen is history to us. But in, in eternity, they look both ways. So as God is going to answer his questions, he's going to look way into eternity past us to answer his questions. Now, the title of my sermon today is, Are You Ready? Because what we're going to talk about today is what is future for us, but we don't know how far in the future it is for us. It could be tomorrow. It could be today. Yeah, wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be great to not finish the sermon and we just get caught up to heaven? Woo! <laughs> that would, that would, we'd hear the trumpet sound, right? That'd be awesome. Well, we're going to look at this now. So turn to Daniel chapter 7, and we're going to begin in verse 15, and we'll read the end of the chapter. chapter. As for me, Daniel, my spirit was distressed within me, and the visions in my mind kept alarming me. I approached one of those who were standing by. Remember where he is. He's in the throne room of heaven. And began asking him the exact meaning of all this. So he told me and he made known to me the interpretation of these things. These great beasts, which are four in number, are four kings who will rise from the earth. But the saints of the highest one will be receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, for all ages to come. Then I desired to know the exact meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly great, dreadful, with its teeth of iron, its claws of bronze, which devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet." And the meaning of the ten horns that were on the head and the other horn which came up before which three of them fell, namely the horn which had eyes and a mouth uttering great boasts and which as large in appearance than the associates. I kept looking and that horn was waging war with the saints and overpowering them. Until the Ancient of Days came, judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the Highest One, and the time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. Thus he said, the fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which will be different from all the other kingdoms, and will devour the whole earth, and tread it down, and crush it. As for the ten horns, out of, the, out of this kingdom ten kings will arise, and another will arise after them, and he will be different from the previous ones, and will subdue three kings. And he will speak out against the Most High, and wear down the saints of the Highest One, and he will intend to make alteration in times and in law, and they will be given into his hand, for a time, times, and a half time. But the court will sit for judgment, and his dominion will be taken away, and annihilated, and destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, and the dominion, and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all the dominions will serve and obey him. At this point, the revelation ended. And as for me, Daniel, my thoughts were greatly alarming me, and my face grew pale, but I kept the matter to myself. Well, Daniel, it says, was distressed and alarmed. Now, I want you to understand it doesn't say that Daniel was worried. You see, there's a lot of people who get worried about the future. We get worried about tomorrow, what's, what's happening in the world. 
You know, what, what is it going to be like? You know, and, and he's not worried. He is distressed and alarmed. Now, why is he distressed and alarmed? Well, remember, Daniel is 80 years old. At the time that he wrote this, he's probably in his early 70s. He has been in captivity since a young teenager in Babylon. The average age for people during that time period was 50 to 60 years old. That's how long they lived. So the likelihood is all the people that came into captivity with him are gone. We don't see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do we? They're not in this. They've already passed on. Everybody that is in Babylon that has come, uh, that, was, that are Israelites or Jews, have been born there. They've never seen the temple. It has now been destroyed. They don't know what it looked like. They've never experienced what Jerusalem looked like in all of its glory. It's all gone. The next time they will see it is in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah when they go back to rebuild. They have no idea. And so he's looking at a nation that doesn't really know who their God is. Sound familiar? We should be distressed and alarmed. We have a whole nation that they're like, oh, well, you know, that Jesus thing's okay for you. But, you know, that's not my thing. You know, Oprah says there's lots of ways to go to heaven, and I like Oprah, right? You know, we, we have all kinds of people that are saying, well, you know, that Jesus thing is okay for the old folks. And he was, he was alarmed. He was dis, distressed because this vision tells them what? What is coming is not good. You're going to, you know, we're now under the Babylonians, but we got the Medio Persians that are coming. And then we got the Greeks that are coming. And then we got the Romans that are coming. And if you think that's bad, we have the end times coming. And to him, there's no idea of how many years there are between each one. I mean, Paul was the same way. Paul was like, ah, I'm expecting God to come back any time. And that was 2,000 years ago. Daniel was distressed and alarmed. And he wants some answers. He, he's got this dream thing down, but God didn't give him the, all the answers that he wanted. And so he asks a question. Now, it says that he goes to somebody standing by, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the thought that this is Gabriel. Remember, there's two archangels in heaven. Gabriel is the spokesperson. Remember, Gabriel came down to Mary and said, or <coughs> Mary and said, hey, you're going to have a baby. Came down to Elizabeth and, or Zachariah and said, hey, you're going to be a dad. Gabriel comes down. He's the spokesperson. Michael's the other one. He's the warrior. And so why do I believe that? Because in Daniel 9... Just, just a chapter away, he says this, While I was speaking in prayer, then the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision previously, came to me in my extreme weariness about the time of the evening offering. See, he knew Daniel from another vision. I believe it was this vision. And, and that would make sense because He's the spokesperson. Now, it's interesting because he says, he says, Gabriel or whoever it is, he said, tell me, give me an interpretation. And Gabriel gives him a pretty short interpretation. He said, these great, verse 17, these great beasts are four in number. There are four kings who will arise on the earth, but the saints of the highest one will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever for all ages to come, period. It's just like going, wait a second. 
Yeah. Daniel needed to ask a specific question. If you want a specific answer, you have to ask a specific question. I had somebody, somebody, we've had a lot of people that have broken bones lately, uh, and most of them are older. And this person came to me and said, uh, said, hey, why did this happen? Now, sometimes your pastor can be a little bit, uh, 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 well, let's say sarcastic. <laughs> so my answer was, gravity and old age. Now, was that correct? I mean, gra- you add gravity and old age and something, <laughs> you're going to break something, right? And, and so afterwards, I, I apologized. <laughs> and, I, and I said, did you really want to know, what is God trying to teach me through this? Or, or, did, or maybe the question you want to know is, is, is there a character quality I need to change in my life? Am I too busy? Do I need to slow down? I mean, I can tell you from personal experience, there have been times in my life that God has says, hey, I'm going to give you this because you're not paying attention. You are so focused on what you want that I'm going to let you lay in the hospital and think about it. And God has done that. There are times, so we need to ask that specific, if we want a specific answer, We've got to ask this specific question. And that's what Daniel's going to do. Because Daniel says, I kind of got the first three beasts. They're kingdoms. And, and we've already talked about this. We talked about it in chapter 2. We've talked about it before with the other visions that have, that have taken place. I think I got the first three. But I, I don't quite have a grasp on this number four this fourth beast and in the fourth in that time it's entered we are introduced to these people that are called the saints gabriel tells him or the angel tells him that there are these saints and who what does it say about the saints but the saints of the highest will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever for all ages to come. Now, who are the saints? Well, if we were to look at today, what would we, who would we say the saints are? That's us. It's the church. But if you believe in the pre-tribulation rapture, okay, that means God's going to come back and call those who are the saved and the, uh, the saved, both alive and dead, out of this world, we'll be in heaven. So he's not talking about us. In the Old Testament, who were the saints? The Jewish. The Jewish people. The Jewish people who believed in the Messiah to come were the saints. But this is also talking about what? A time in the future. They shall reign for how long? Forever and ever. So I want you to think about, once again, the church has gone out in the rapture, and there's seven years of tribulation, and Revelation tells us that the term it uses, myriads and myriads, will, will be around the throne of those who came to know Jesus during the tribulation. They aren't the Jewish believers. God will protect them. They're, they're people who come to know. And there will also be those who will, who will make it all the way through into the millennial kingdom that are saints during the tribulation. So during the tribulation, you will have the Jewish people that are coming into the tribulation that will get saved. They will be saints. And you will have people who will get saved during the tribulation period that are also called saints. Now, he says all of these people are going to be in heaven. Uh, They're going to be part, I shouldn't say heaven, they're going to be part of this time period, this tribulation period that we're talking about here. 
And then there's, he talks about uh, what happens to these saints. And remember, the best, um, the best explanation of the Bible is the Bible, right? So Revelation chapter 13 tells us about who these saints are and what's happening to them. And it will also be given to him, who's the him, it's the Antichrist, to make war with the saints. That's with the Jewish believers and those who are Gentile believers that come to Jesus during the tribulation period. To overcome them and to have authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. So we have these saints and he gives this very short answer. And so, so when Daniel answers Gabriel and says, wait a second, I want more information. When he does that, he also gives us more information about the dream. So if you go back and look at, look at chapter, earlier in chapter uh, 7, uh, you'll see he talks about, he gives uh, two verses, verses 7 and 8, that he talks about this fourth beast. Now when he gets ready to ask the question to Gabriel, tell me more about the fourth beast, I want you to notice what he says about this fourth beast in verses uh, 23 to 26. Excuse me, Daniel in, it says in verses 19 to, to uh, 22. So Daniel's asking a question. Then I desired to know the exact meaning of the fourth beast. Look what he says about the fourth beast. It's different from all the others. Exceedingly dreadful with teeth of iron and claws of bronze is devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with his feet. And the meaning of, he wants to know the meaning of the ten horns that were on its head. And the other horn which came up and which three of them fell, namely that horn that had eyes and a mouth uttering great boasts, which was larger in appearance to its associates. I kept looking and the horn was waging war with the saints and overpowering them until the ancient of days came judging. Judgment was passed over in favor of the saints of the highest one and the time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. Those are all descriptions from Daniel of his vision. He says, oh yeah, by the way, this is what I saw and this is what I really, I'm curious about. This fourth beast, it's very powerful and it has ten horns. Now, I don't know about you, but other than, unless you're, you're a deer hunter or an elk hunter, and those technically are not horns, those are antlers. <laughs> so this thing has ten horns, and one pops out, knocks three of them out of the way. You know, see, he says, I, I need some help here. And so then we have, we have Gabriel giving him the answers in verse 23. Thus he said, Gabriel, the fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on earth, which will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth and tread it down and crush it. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom ten kings will arise, and another will arise after them, and he will be different from the previous ones and will subdue the three kings, and he will speak out against the Most High and will wear down the saints of the Highest One, and he will intend to make alterations in times and in law, and they will be given into his hand for time, times and a half time. Three and a half years. Wow. Pretty, pretty definitive now. He asks a specific question and he gets a specific answer. So the kingdom is, is said what? It will be different and it will devour the whole earth. 
And remember, as we've watched this happen before with the, with the statue in chapter 2, and, and, and on, as it, on as it went to, to this current one, we've watched these kingdoms, and they've all taken the world, how? By might, military might. That's the way, that's the, way the Babylonians did it. That's the way the, Gre- the Medo-Persians did it. That's the way the Greeks did it. That's the way the Romans did it. But all of a sudden we have a different way to take over. And it's for the whole earth. Um, So as we come to this, it's like, wait a second. You know, the whole earth is populated. Anybody know how many nations we have right now? 195. By the, the, uh, you know, that's what the United Nations tells us. They recognize 195 nations. But yet he's talking about what? Ten kings that rule the whole earth. And and you kind of go, how do we go from 195 to 10? That's kind of getting things down there. Well, it's a little thing called globalization. Anybody heard that term recently? Right? All you got to do is turn on the business channel. Globalization. Anybody ever seen a little pop-up uh, when, you're, when you're in the middle of something uh, and it says Timu? T-E-M-U, you know what that is? Uh, that's the government of China trying to sell you all of their goods. Right? And while they're doing that, they're mining all of your information. <laughs> that's Globalization. You get on the computer, you can go, you can buy stuff from all over the world. And it'll be at your doorstep. You know, we, we once had a, we once had the, the, the great meeting of all, our, our mailman showed up at the same time as the Amazon driver, the FedEx driver, and the UPS driver. We had the great trifecta. I mean, it was right there. I mean, I'm like, goodness sakes. But what is globalization? There is actually a definition. The process by which businesses or other organizations develop internal influence, international influence, or start operating on an international scale. So you're like, but what does that have to do with me? It has to do is with how do you go from 195 countries to 10 kings? How do we get there? We're already going there. How many of you have been to Europe in the last uh, 10 years? We got a couple, right? Okay. They have now a thing called the European Union. 27 countries. You can get, you go into one country, you can travel anywhere you want. You don't have to show your passport to cross borders. 27 countries in the European Union. Well, and then you got Britain who X'd out, right? 27 countries, European Union. That's a, that's a pretty large block of people, isn't it? When I was traveling to Africa, I became uh, introduced to a thing called the African Union. 55 countries in Africa. They're all united for two things. One is for military support. The other is for economy. You can, and, and so you have these, these nations, 55, all of Africa, the African Union. Oh, we're starting to pare it down a little bit, aren't we? That's, I had made a mistake in my math earlier. That's 82. 82. Two Two separate large individual groups. What are the first, what are the two largest countries in the world by population? China and and India. You know what the third population group is, third largest? What? No idea. Most people don't. It's called the state of the African diaspora. 
How many people have heard of the state of the African diaspora? Most, I, I don't see anybody raising their hand. You know where it's played out in the world stage today? Haiti. Haiti. Okay, stay with me. Kenya. So why would Kenya want to go all the way to Haiti to help them? The Kenyan police have said, we will lead the, the, the folks going in to train the Haitian police to take back their country. Why is that? Because Haiti is part of the African diaspora. 350 million people across the world are part of the state of the African diaspora. You, don't look it up now. I see some people going, what is this? What is this? Yeah. Write it down. Go home and read about it. Because it's in today's news. 350 million people, the third largest population group in the world. And they're, they're, they're all around the globe. So we have another group, right, that takes up many, many different states and countries. Uh, the Eurasian Economic Union, a little place called Russia and four additional countries that take up all of Russia and, and that part of the world. We have the Southeast Asia Economic Union, 10 nations that are all coming together. You can start doing the math, can't you? How do we get from 195 to 10? Pretty rapidly. We have a little thing called the North American Freedom of Trade Act, AFTA. Oh, guess what that makes up? All of North America. Hmm. Are we getting close? Absolutely. Now you say, well, Pastor Ben, why in the world are you telling us all of this? It has a little verse called Matthew 24, 36. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. What hour? The hour that Jesus is going to come back. No one knows it, but who? The Father. The Father knows it. So that means... There's a guy by the name of Satan. He's the third arch, archangel that we didn't talk about. His real name's Lucifer. He's kicked out of heaven, right? Comes down to earth, creates all kinds of havoc with a little lady by the name of Eve and Adam in the garden and is still active today. The, a matter of fact, did you know that Satan knows more about the Bible than most Christians do? He's had, he's had all of these years to, to learn. He's watched all of this. Now, what has Satan had to do? If he doesn't know when the ten, ten kings are going to take over the world, what does he have to do in every generation? He has to prepare, what? Ten kings. Because ten kings are going to rule and they're going to be under his thumb. That's what the book of Revelation says. Who else has he had to prepare? An antichrist. Absolutely. Ever since Jesus left, Satan has had to prepare somebody to become the antichrist. Now he hasn't taken over yet. So there is an antichrist who is living right now. And he's being prepared. Now whether this is the Antichrist that will take over in the tribulation, only God knows that because only God knows when we're leaving. Matter of fact, in 1 John chapter 2, it says, uh, children, it is the last hour. Now when was John writing? First century. A couple years ago. All right? 
John's writing in the first century. Children, it is the last hour. Just as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many, many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that is the last hour. John thought it was coming over 2,000 years. He thought it was on the way. Hasn't made it here yet. But he has to, Satan, because he doesn't know, all of these things have to be prepared beforehand. If you don't, you know, all you have to do is watch the news. Watch who's coming up. You know, people have watched it. They, they said, some people thought that Hitler was going to be the Antichrist. Well, I guarantee you this, Hitler was an Antichrist. He hated God. He hated Jesus. He burned Bibles. He, he you know, and you, you say, well, you know, what does that have to do? He, that was Hitler. That was World War II. That was a long time ago. Did you know on Easter Sunday, I want to say it was Tennessee, but it was back in the south somewhere, somebody brought a trailer full of Bibles and burned it outside of a church. Huh. You think they were pro-Christ? Don't think so. Antichrist. And we see that over and over, over again today. And two verses, or four verses later in, in 1 John 2, it says, who is Satan? Who is the Antichrist? I mean, who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Oh, you can get to heaven anyway. Don't worry about what the Bible says. Don't worry that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. The Antichrist... And, and, and the description of the Antichrist here in Revelation, he talks about him being blas a man of blasphemy and the fact that he's overpowering the saints. Matter of fact, in Revelation chapter 13, verses 5 and 6, it says this of the Antichrist. There was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemy, and the authority to act for 42 months was given to him. And he opened his mouth and blasphemies from against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, that is, those who dwell in heaven. We got any math majors in here? 42 months. How long is 42 months? Three and a half years. Oh, wait a second. What did Daniel say? Oh, he's going to reign for how long? Three and a half years. And what's he going to do? He will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints. 42 months, three and a half years. He will open his mouth. I mean, it's, you can take these words and you can put them side by side with what he says in the book of Daniel. Matter of fact, this is there there are some liberal theologians who want to say that, well, the last half of Daniel was had to have been written by somebody much later in history because it's so specific. Well, I don't know about that, because when we get to chapter eight, your eyes are going to be opened. And even here, he says, he is, he is so enthralled with what's going on. He says, and it's all about Satan being prepared for what God has to come in the future. What is our future? We know it hasn't happened yet. We haven't seen it, but it's coming. And he ends with, uh, Gabriel ends with talking about what is going to happen to the Antichrist, what is going to happen to Satan. 
Notice what he says. But the court, now what court? Where is Daniel? He's in heaven. He's in the throne room. And this is what he says. But the court will sit for judgment and his dominion will be taken away and annihilated and destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty and the dominion and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom and all dominions will serve and obey him. I want you to turn to Revelation chapter 19. And I want us to do the comparison, right? What did, he, what did we say? The best explanation of the Bible is the Bible. Let me read to you, or turn there. Revelation 19, 20 through verse 3 in chapter 20. The beast, who is the beast? The beast is the Antichrist. The beast was seized, and with him the false prophet who pre performed signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his enemy image. And these two were thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword, which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. Now watch what happens with Satan. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until a thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. Sound pretty close, doesn't it? A matter of fact, it sounds almost identical. God will destroy Satan after the after he's let loose for a little while, it says that Satan is condemned and cast into, into the abyss forever. And where will we be? <laughs> yeah, we could go, we could go just over, over one more chapter, right? And we could say, chapter 21, and then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there's no longer any sea. And I saw a holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready for the bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men and he will dwell with them, dwell among them, and they shall be his people. And God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will no longer be any death and there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. For the first things have passed away. Amen. Amen. You see, that's what we're looking for. But are we ready? You say, yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. Amen. But let me ask you something. Is everybody you know ready to go? Daniel was distressed and alarmed. Why? Because he could see all the people around him that weren't ready, that did not know Jehovah God, that did not know the Yahweh of their fathers, that did not know that, that the Messiah was coming. He was alarmed and he was distressed. You see, there, there's going to come a, a moment in time when God says, it's time. And it's going to click into motion everything we just read. The ten kings will become apparent. The Antichrist will become apparent. He's going to come as a peacemaker to start out with. 
That's how he gets everything together. He will be a peacemaker. The question is, what activates that? Well, I believe that God, because, because of who he is, it says he's written all of our days in his book. You see, there's going to come a time when God says, okay, the church is done. The church is full. The last ones come to know me before the tribulation starts. Have you ever thought that maybe that last person is somebody you know and your assignment is to lead them to Christ so we can all go home? Have you ever thought about that? Gene and I have a saying. What is it, Gene? One One more. Just one more. What if that one more was somebody that God has sent you to? You see, we may be ready. I've got my go bag. (laughs) I don't need a go bag when I go to heaven. (laughs) I'm ready. But is everybody else ready? That's the question we have to ask ourselves. You see, we're we're going to come to communion right now. <clears throat> As we come to communion, I want you to think about something. We do, we do communion, and most of the time we do communion, we think a lot about ourselves. Because Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And we think about, oh, we're so thankful that his body was broken for us. We're so thankful that the blood was shed for us. But what about them? What about the one more? What about the last one? Are they ready? Because if they're not, they're going to head into the book of Revelation. And you can go home and read it tonight. And if you don't weep, over someone you know, that if God were to come back right now, they would go through the tribulation. And yes, they may come to know Jesus in the tribulation. But you know where most of them end up? Martyred. I would much rather them come with me and be standing next to me when my God calls and the trumpet sounds and he says, Ben, it's time time to come home. And I grabbed that hand of the person next to me and said, they're coming with me because they accepted Jesus as their Savior. As we take communion today, I'm going to ask you to do one thing. I'm going to ask you to think of who's the one more. Who is one person, one person this week that you'll reach out to say, are you ready? Are you ready? I'm ready. Are you ready? Would you come with me? Would you get yourself ready? We have communion in the middle, the back two corners and the front two corners. The cups are stacked with the wafer at the bottom, the juice at the top. There's gluten-free options in the middle of each tray. As you you take the communion and go back and sit at your seats, pray. God, give give me the courage. I had a man in this church share with me. He'd been estranged from his sons for over 10 years, afraid to make the telephone call. 
And I just encouraged him, you don't know, you don't know the answer until you call. And he picked up the phone and he called his two sons and God was on the other end because both of them said, yeah, dad, we'd love to get back together with you. We'd love to mend our relationship. That may be somebody that you need to call today that needs to know Jesus. You need to mend that relationship so you can tell them about the Jesus that loves you. Let's pray. Oh God, we come before you. I am so thankful that I'm ready. But I am so distressed by those who are God, give me the power. Give me the strength to share one more this week. One more. So they'll be ready to. In Jesus' name.